This lecture is part of an online course on commutative algebra and will be about the famous Hilbert null Stellen sets. In case you're wondering what this means, null means zero, this means position, and sats means statement or theorem. Um, so um, th there are two forms of this. There's a sort of weak version and a strong version. So the weak version is as follows. We can ask what are the maximal ideals of a polynomial ring, K, X, Y, um, I'm going to just write down two variables, but in general, there can be several. Well, there are some obvious ones. Well, the obvious ones are things of the form X minus A, Y minus B, and so on. So these correspond to points A, B, and so on of K to the N. Notice, by the way, that here the parentheses mean the ideal generated by these elements, whereas here the parentheses mean the coordinates of a point. As usual, notation is a bit um, illogical. So what this says is the maximal ideals of this um, are related to the points of K to the N. Um, if K is algebraically closed, This gives all maximal ideals. And this is the weak null Stellenzatz. Um, what happens if K isn't algebraically closed? Well, if K isn't algebraically closed, then there, there can be other maximal ideals. For example, suppose we take K to be the reals and look at the polynomial <coughs> ring in just one variable over the reals, then we see that x squared plus one is a maximal ideal, but doesn't correspond to a point of the line over the reals. It's sort of something to do with a, the, 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 the point i in the complex numbers, but um, that's the, in the algebraic closure of R. So that's the weak null Stellenzatz. Um, secondly, we, we can have the strong null Stellenzatz. So suppose I is some ideal in K, X, Y, and so on. Then um, we can look at, we, we, we can put V to be the variety of zeros of i. In other words, the, the set of points where all elements of i vanish. So if all elements of i vanish on some algebraic set, then v might be this. And now we can ask the obvious question, um, what is the ideal of elements or polynomials vanishing on v? And the obvious guess is it's just I. And in fact, people seem to have sort of implicitly assumed that the answer was just I in the very early days of algebraic geometry. Um, well, um, certainly, um, if we call this ideal J, I is obviously contained in J, but it's not necessarily equal to it. For example, we could just look inside the ring K of X and take the um, ideal to be generated by x squared. So the, the, the variety of zeros v is then just the point naught. And so j, which is the set of polynomials vanishing at naught, is the ideal x, which is obviously not equal to i. So you see here the problem is that x squared is in i, but x is not an i. And more generally, we can see that if f to the n is an i, so that means f to the n vanishes um, on the whole of v, then obviously f um, vanishes on v. 
So F is in the ideal J. So we see that the radical of I is also contained in J. Um, and the strong null Stellenzatz um, says that if K is algebraically closed, then these are equal. Let's take K algebraically closed. So this is the strong. And I'll spell null Stellenzatz with an N pot because I've run out of room and pot because I'm tired of writing out a long word. Um, so in, in other words, uh, J is a sort of radical of the ring R over I. So, so, so J over I is the radical of the ring R over I, or the nil radical, I guess, because there are several other sorts of radical. In other words, just the nil potent elements. Um, now you might think nil potent elements of a ring are easy to find. I mean, if, if, a, if, if, you know, if some square of an element is zero, then it ought to be really obvious what that element is. But in fact, it isn't. Um, nil potent elements um, of a ring can be really hard to find in practice. So what I'm going to do is to give you some examples to show that it, it really isn't obvious what nil potent elements of a ring are. So what we're going to do is look at the space of nil potent matrices of some size. So suppose X is a matrix and let's just call its entries X11 up to X1N xn1 and so on and um, x is nil potent means some power of it is equal to zero and it's pretty obvious that if some power is zero then x to the n equals zero so we can let the ideal i in k x11 up to xn n be generated by the coefficients of x to the n. So in other words, um, the zero set of i is just the nil potent matrices. Um, and we can now we can ask, are there any other functions which vanish on the set of nil potent matrices? Um, so let's call the set of nil potent matrices V. So let's find um, other functions vanishing on V. Well, one obvious one is X11 plus X22 and so on plus, plus XNN. So why does that vanish on V? Well, <clears throat> um, X nil potent implies all eigenvalues are zero, which implies the trace is zero, because the trace is just the sum of the eigenvalues. And obviously the trace can't be in this ideal because the coefficients of x to the n all have degree, they're all homogeneous of degree n, so um, something of degree one, such as the trace, can't possibly be in this ideal. Um, well, is that all? Well, no, there, there are some other ones, because more generally, if we look at the characteristic polynomial, if we take the determinant of lambda times i um, minus x, then um, this is just equal to lambda to the n for x nil potent. So all coefficients of um, the characteristic polynomial determinant of lambda i minus x, um, all coefficients of this of lambda to the i for i less than n, I guess, 
also vanish on the um, nilpotent matrices. So, so there's quite a lot of polynomials that vanish on V, but aren't immediately obvious. For example, let's just do this explicitly for two by two matrices so you can see what's going on. So let's write the matrix X as, let's call the entries A, B, C, and D, because I will get confused by subscripts. And then we can see X squared is equal to A um, squared plus B, C, A plus D, B, A plus D, C, and D squared plus B, C. So um, these four elements generate the ideal I, so it's generated by A squared plus B, C, A plus D, B, A plus D, C, and D squared plus B, C. And what we're saying, what, what we're trying to do is to find the radical of the ideal I. And you know, if you look at it, it's, I think you'll agree, if you just look at this, it's not at all obvious what the radical of this ideal is. Um, well, we've just said that A plus D must be in the radical by the strong null Stellenzatz. Um, so this means A plus D to the K is an I for some K. And you might try and guess what is K? Well, there's a pretty obvious guess, which is that K is equal to two. I mean, what else could it possibly be? We're looking at two by two matrices. It's, it's going to be ridiculous if k is bigger than two. In fact, k isn't two. You can check that um, a plus d squared is actually not in i, which is fairly easy to check because everything's homogeneous at degree two, and this, this just doesn't work. I mean, in fact, we find that a plus d cubed is an i. You have to go up to the third power of a plus d, and it's not immediately obvious that a plus d cubed is an i. You, you can notice that i contains uh, the following entries. It contains a plus d times all the following entries. Well, it's got b and c and a minus d. So b and c come from these entries. a minus d comes from taking the difference of these two. Um, and it's also got a squared and d squared. And a squared comes in here because, for example, a plus d times um, a squared plus bc um, minus a plus d times bc. Uh, so, so, so a squared times a plus d is that minus that. And this and this are both in the ideal. And now you notice that a plus d squared is in the ideal generated by these things here because it's just equal to um, um, it's just equal to two a squared plus two d squared minus a minus d squared. So so all these entries here are in this cluster of things. So I think you agree it's not at all obvious or trivial that, a, that some power of a plus d is in this ideal. You have to do a fair amount of work to see it. Um, if we actually want to work out the radical properly, well, we can do it like this. You, you also notice that the determinant a d minus b c um, is equal to a plus d times d minus bc plus d squared. Um, so this is the trace, and this is in i. So we can see directly that some power of the determinant is, in fact, the cube of the determinant is going to be in i. Um, um, and in fact, uh, the radical root of i is equal to um, a plus d, a d minus b c. Um, well, we've shown these are in the radical. Um, um, and if you look at k 
of A, B, C, D, and you mod out by A plus D, A, D minus B, C. Well, this says that D is equal to minus A, so we can write this as K, A, B, C, modulo the irreducible polynomial A squared plus B, C. And this is a nice irreducible polynomial. So this has um, no zero divisors. In particular, it's got no nil potent elements. So, so these do generate the full radical of I. Um, so, um, so let, let me give you another example to show how difficult it is to find the radical of something. Suppose I've got two matrices, x is x11 up to x1n, xn1 up to xnn, and y is equal to y11, and so on. And let's look at i is the ideal of k x11 up to ynn generated by the coefficients of xy minus yx. So in other words, it's, it's the ideal um, whose vanishing set V is pairs of commuting matrices. Well, that can't be too difficult to figure out because, you know, a pair of matrices commuting is about one of the simplest conditions you can possibly put in a matrix. So we want to know what is the radical of I. In particular, we can ask, is the radical of I equal to I? And the answer is, I don't know. And as far as I know, nobody else knows either. Um, this seems to be a very difficult problem. In fact, um, the space of pairs of commuting matrices turns out to be an extraordinarily difficult space to deal with for some weird reason. Um, the, 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 it can easily be reduced to the problem of two commuting nil potent matrices, but then you find trying to analyze the variety of pairs of commuting nil potent matrices also seems to be incredibly difficult. So the point of this is it's generally a really hard problem to find the radical of an ideal. Um, well, let's give a proof of the weak null Stellensatz. Over complex numbers. And in this proof, I'm going to cheat by working over the complex numbers, which allows me to give an incredibly short proof of it. So put M is a maximal ideal of C X1 up to Xn. So this means C X1 up to Xn over M um, is um, a finitely generated extension of C what this means as a C algebra and a field. And it's a field because M is maximal. Um, and now you notice that this thing here um, has countable dimension as a C vector space. rather obviously because there are only a countable number of monomials in x1 up to xn. Um, well, that implies that the field is algebraic. Well, the reason for that is that if, um, if it had a transcendental element, so if um, it contains an element A is transcendental over, over C, then the elements one over A minus alpha for alpha in C would be an 
uncountable number of linearly independent um, elements because the complex numbers is uncountable and you can see these are obviously linearly independent over C. So this field is um, an algebraic extension of C. Um, so is C as C is algebraically closed. Now we're finished because um, um, if this, um, so, so we've shown that this is equal to C. And this just means that each of these Xi's is equal to some element Ai in C. So Xi minus Ai is in M. So M is generated by X1 minus A1, X2 minus A2, and so on. Um, so that result is kind of cheating because it's using the fact that the complex numbers are uncountable. And that's not really a very algebraic argument. It's more of a sort of set theory argument where you're um, arguing about the difference between countable and uncountable elements. So we'll have to fix that next lecture. But here is a very short um, proof of the weak null Stellansatz over, over the complex numbers. So it would also work over any uncountable algebraically closed field. Well, having done the short proof of the weak null Stellansatz, we can also give a short proof that the weak null Stellansatz implies the strong null Stellansatz. And this will also only take a few lines. So what do we do? Well, we let I be an ideal in um, Kx1 up to Xn. Here, I don't need to assume K is the complex numbers. The weak null Stellansatz implies the strong null Stellansatz for any field K, and as we we're about to prove. And let V is the zip be the zero set, and let F vanish on V. And we want to show that F to the M is in I for some number M. And what we do is we localize at F. So localizing at F means we sort of want to introduce an element such that F X naught equals one. Well, um, what we're going to do is not quite localize at F. We're actually going to work in the polynomial ring generated by X naught. So what we're going to do is we look at the ideal generated by I and one minus X naught F in k x naught up to x n. So we're sort of thinking of this as being a localization at f, except we haven't quite quotiented out by this yet. So we haven't quite localized. And this is called the Rabinovich trick. So Rabinovich's idea was to introduce this extra variable x naught. And these have no common roots. because any common root of all the elements i uh, must be a common root of f, so f times x naught vanishes, so this doesn't vanish. So it's not in any maximal ideal by the weak null Stellansatz, because the maximal ideals just correspond to the um, points of um, k to the n plus one, and we've shown that it doesn't vanish at any of these. So you see, um, when we say the weak null Stellansatz implies the strong null Stellansatz, we, we, that, that, what we really mean is the weak null Stellansatz in n plus one variables implies the strong null Stellansatz in n variables. Um, anyway, so it's not in any maximal ideals. If it's not in any maximal ideals, so it is 
just the ideal k x naught up to x n. So we can write one is equal to a one b one plus plus um, a something b something plus a times one minus x naught f. So here, all the b i's are in i. And all the AIs are in all the AIs and the element A are in K X naught up to X N. Um, and now we just put F equals one over X naught in the field of rational functions. And we find that one is equal to a one b one plus plus a n b n, where now each um, a i is in k x one up to x n one over f. So um, we we have a i equals c i over f to the um, m for some fixed m. And now we just clear denominators and we find f to the k is equal to c1 b1 plus, um, plus c something b something. And this is in i. So we've shown that, um, sorry, that should be a m, not a k. So we've shown that f to the m is in the ideal i, and that's the strong null Stellenzatz, which we were, which we were trying to prove. Um, so, next lecture will give a slightly more honest proof of the weak null Stellenzatz that works over general fields. But this is just a very short um, proof of the null Stellenzatz for the complex numbers.